Okay. And I have three bullet point outline, and that is what is the problem we're dealing with? Why are we concerned about this problem? And what are we going to do about it? This is my former backyard where I lived in Lublin, Ohio, and this is part of the problem. Um, we have about 45,000, or excuse me, 45 million acres of manicured lawn in this country. That's about one and three quarters the size of Ohio or equal to New England. And what's it take to keep a lawn looking like this? Well, you know, Mother Nature does not like a monoculture, and this certainly is a monoculture. Um, and she likes to have diversity, biodiversity. And so what do we have to do? We have to fight against Mother Nature constantly with all kinds of herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, probably some other CIDESs that I don't know about, tons and tons of fertilizer, so lots of chemicals. And then what else? Billions of gallons of water to keep this green, especially during the summer, and lots of petroleum, gas and oil. And then, of course, millions of hours of time to keep this manicured yard, and also a lot of land that I consider really wasted because we could be using it for native habitat like this, which is much, much more productive. This particular yard is going to sequester a lot more carbon. It's going to control and manage our water. It's going to help increase our soils. And most of all, it's going to contribute to a lot more life and especially pollinators. So when I said, what is the problem? This is one of the main ones we have today. And hopefully one of my main objectives today is to get you excited about moving more towards this or this. And the other issues that we have with native habitat are listed here, and I'll go through them fairly quickly. The first one I have listed is, of course, the loss of habitat. Every year we lose a oh, million, million and a half acres of habitat to development, roads, you know, parking lots, you name it. And then often when we develop an area, we segment it. So maybe it's a nice woods and we put a road down the middle of that nice woods and basically segment the woods and really reduce its carrying capacity dramatically when we do that. And we have, of course, roads and lanes, et cetera, all over the United States doing that. And then when we do that, when we segment or we develop an area, often we end up with edge areas tremendously increased, and those are great for invasive species. And thus, in spaces, invasive species often jump into those areas. And to give you an idea, only about 5% of our land in the continental United States is pristine or without any kind of change taking place from a human standpoint. And mainly that affects agriculture and of course suburbia and urban areas, but also the fact that virtually all of our land has some type of invasive species on it. Next is agricultural practices, and there's two main ones that have influenced our native habitat. One is the use of uh, insecticide, excuse me, herbicides on agricultural land. And that was started by Monsanto when they developed um, oh, um, the herbicide, oh, geez, I'm drawing a blank on the common name. <laughs> Sorry about that. You all know it and I can't think of it right now, but the herbicide has been around for years and years and they have Roundup, Roundup, there we go, Roundup it, ready yeah. seed. Yeah, Roundup Ready seeds, and so the crops are already resistant because they've been genetically modified to be resistant to the Roundup. So basically, farmers or planes can fly over a field and drop the Roundup. It kills everything in that field except for the crop. And that's been a huge influence on sides of fields, even within the field. Give you an idea, I was born and raised in Delaware County, so close to most of you up there. And uh, across my, from my house was a nice cornfield most of the time. And uh, when I was playing with a lot of my buddies, we'd run through the cornfield, we'd end up coming in 
And my mother wasn't real happy with me because often I had this white, white sap stuck on my clothes, maybe even in my hair. What was that? Well, common milkweed was growing in those corn rows or around the fields. And that was actually sap or milk sap from the common milkweed. And now none of that, that's all been wiped out. And the other big influence here from an agricultural standpoint is the fact that in 2007 through 2010, the Ag Department released about 25 million acres of fallow ground back into production, into ag production for mainly the uh, production of ethanol. And so that immediately within those three years wiped out millions of acres. And then the third thing I have listed is treatment of land and water. And that's what I was talking to when I first started out, when I talked about my yard, all the things we do to that yard to keep it looking manicured. Next are diseases and alien pests. And I think you're all familiar, unfortunately, with some of these, like the emerald ash borer, which is, came into our uh, Michigan and into Ohio, what, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 years ago now, and basically has wiped out all the ash trees. So unfortunately, we've had diseases and alien pests come in and reduce our native habitat as well. And then on top of everything else, we have climate change that's influencing things. So native habitat is really taking a very significant hit uh, when we consider going back just maybe 200, 250 years. And to give you an idea of what this is leading to, of course, the plants are at the base of our food chain, and I'm gonna show you that in a minute. And the next level up are our invertebrate herbivores or in our herbivores and our invertebrates are dropping drastically. And actually, this is an old slide, as you can see on here. This is about 2008, 2009, so it's really not very recent, but it was one that showed Lepidoptera. And when I mentioned that order, that is the order of Lepidoptera or butterflies and moths. And whenever I mention that today, I want you to think actually more about moths than butterflies, even though I'm a butterfly guy. The moths outnumber the butterflies in Ohio and throughout North America, probably about 25 to 1. And there's still a lot of research going on that. So that's a major influence from the standpoint of our pollinators. And then overall, this drop has probably been somewhere in this neighborhood with the Lepidoptera, about 30%. There was an Ohio study that was done and just released in 2019. As a matter of fact, they used some of the data that uh, I and my team have generated from the Cincinnati Nature Center when we butterfly monitor. And those monitoring stations are done around Ohio. And they re looked at all that information over a 20 year period and found about a 30% drop of the butterflies in Ohio over that 20 year period of time. There's other studies, a big German study was released in 2017. They have been going back to 1989, so about, what is that, 27 years, I think it was, and they found a 75% decrease in all the flying insects that they were capturing, and this was in a nature preserve setting. It was in various nature preserves around Germany, and there's lots more studies, and unfortunately, all of them come back looking similar to this. This line really is too steep. This would be like the 75% drop. But overall, we've probably had about a 45% drop in invertebrates around the world. So quite significant, obviously. Now, one that you might be able to relate to a little closer to home are the monarch issues that we are having to face. And uh, most of you, I'm guessing, are very familiar with the monarch. And this particular, we're talking about the eastern monarch that migrates to Mexico in the fall and overwinters there. And this shows the number of hectares. And as you can see, it's been a dramatic drop over the last 20 years. And we've had about a 90% decline of monarchs overwintering in Mexico. And of course, that means we, we don't see nearly as many monarchs in our, our area as well. And let me give you an idea of what that actually is probably a very, very conservative estimate of the monarchs dropping. I have in my hands a book called Butterfly People. It's a history of butterfly and the people, butterflies and the people that were involved in butterfly back in the late 
eight, mid to late 1800s and then on into the early 1900s. And a passage out of here reads, everywhere men and women reported monarchs flying by the millions in September in gigantic undulating waves extending for miles. Like the passenger pigeon migration of the age, these swarms sometimes obscured the sun, blurring day into night. So much, much more dramatic situation than we're seeing now. So we would probably estimate mate, that we not only had a 90% drop, we may have had a 95, 97, 98% drop in monarchs. Okay, and let me just pause for a moment here. I kind of jumped ahead a little bit. Let me be sure to define some terms and be sure we're on the same page. For instance, when I talk about pollinators, what am I talking about? Well, probably the first thing that comes to mind are what? Bees, right? They're certainly the number one pollinator. But second or third are the flies. You ever think of those as being pollinators? Important group. How about the lepidopter again? The moths and the butterflies, then the beetles, the wasps, ants. And then we finally get down to some of the birds and some of the mammals. And believe it or not, even mosquitoes, people ask, you know, what are good mosquitoes? Well, they're a great food source for one, but they're also some species are pollinators. So those are our main pollinators and certainly the top three or four, bees, flies, the lepidoptera, and the wasp and the beetles. And then when we actually say pollination, we're talking about moving pollen from the anther or the male portion of the plant to the stigma or the female portion. And when I mention non-native and native, and I started out talking about this, and I should have really defined these, native being, and there's quite a few different definitions. You can get into the ecological definition, but I'll just stick with one that says, native plants are the plants that are here in our area prior to introduction of any other plants. And generally, we talk about that as being pre-Europe settlement. So going back, say, 400 years approximately. And then when you look at non-native, it's just the flip side. That's a plant that has been brought here, usually by us, by humans. Not always, but generally speaking, that's the way it's done. And we have sped that situation up tremendously, bringing in so many non-native plants into this country. And then I'm, you're going to hear me mention Dr. Talmy's name, or Doug Talmy. Again, I'm guessing that most of you are familiar with this, since this is a homegrown national park from one of his books. And Dr. Talmy is a PhD. He's the chair and professor of ecology and entomology at the University of Delaware. And he's extremely widely published, probably 100, 110 publications, three books lectures all over the United States, and I think in other countries as well. So those are, he's one of the most important people, and I really call him the guru of the native plant movement. So you're going to hear me refer to his information quite frequently. And let me give another shout out, though, to someone you may have not heard about, and that is Sarah Stein. Sarah Stein was really probably the first person, she was kind of like Rachel Carson, the Silent Spring, <coughs> excuse me, she published a book called Noah's Garden in 1993, so well before Talmy published anything on, and it's called Noah's Garden, Restoring the Ecology of Our Own Backyards. So she was really the forerunner of this whole um, movement. And unfortunately, she died in her 60s and wasn't able to continue this, and she didn't publish until fairly late in her life. So that's some background on some of the things I'm going to be talking about today. And let me move on then from here. I was talking about, of course, the decline in our invertebrate species and in particular the monarchs. Let me move into why are we concerned about this decline? You know, a lot of people say, hey, the best ants getting into my house, flies, bugs flying around. That's a good thing, isn't it? Well, nope, not good at all. Because here in the terrestrial food chain, you see that these invertebrates are right in the middle here. And I'm going to back off here to the solar energy to just give you a quick rundown of what's happening. Again, I'm guessing that almost all of you are familiar with this. The solar energy is being converted through photosynthesis into chemical energy in the form of sugars and carbohydrates. That's what the plants are doing. So that's why our native plants are so important. 
And then those native plants then are going to be eaten by the herbivores. And the herbivores are really the key then to converting this chemical energy in the form of carbohydrates into proteins and fats. And then they are like a big hot dog for the birds because they've got all this protein and fat. To give you an idea, there's twice as much protein in insect meat as there is in beef. Or another interesting I find is that a turkey leg, uh, a big caterpillar, mm -hmm. when I'm talking mm -hmm. a big caterpillar, I'm talking three to four inches, has as much fat and protein as a turkey leg. So this is a terrific food source for everything up the ladder here or up the food chain. And of course, this really is a very complex food web. But in essence, it's and uh, a good way to look at this is that our herbivores, and especially our caterpillars, are eating, getting, eating the plants. So by being eaten, and then they by being eaten, sorry, by eating and then being eaten, they are powering everything up the food chain. And caterpillars in particular are extremely important because I've mentioned earlier, they're like a big hot dog for all kinds of species and especially birds. And Dr. Talmy has pointed out that around 96% of our terrestrial birds in this area or throughout most of the United States feed their young insects. Some spiders or arachnids as well, but mainly insects and by far, the majority of them prefer caterpillars. Again, why is that? Well, that big fat hot dog, again, has a lot of protein and fat. It's soft, it's readily digested by the fledglings. You think about a beetle with those hard wings, ah, not, good for the, uh, not good for the birds, the little ones very much. So they really prefer caterpillars. And so a lot of my focus today is going to be on the native plants that then benefit our caterpillars or our Lepidopter species. Now, I mentioned the native plants and why do we talk about and why do I emphasize native plants so much? Well, it's really highlighted right here in the three words. They've evolved together, meaning that the insects and the plants have evolved and they have a very tight connection chemically, sometimes physically as well, but especially a chemical connection. So certain animals like the monarch species can only eat milkweed because of the chemical interactions between milkweed and the monarch butterfly. So that's really the crux of the matter is the fact that going back millennia, these plants, these native plants in our area have evolved with the native wildlife. Secondly, the insect herbivores typically do not eat the non-native plants. They are not, those are not the native plants that they've evolved with, so they won't eat them. So what good are those non-native plants doing? Not a heck of a whole lot. Matter of fact, the whole issue with plants in our gardens has been focused on mainly beauty. What looks nice? What we hope you'll start to think about more is the ecological benefit of the plants. And when you look at native plants versus non-native, it's a dramatic difference. Um, generally, native plants will produce about three to four times the biomass of insects. And if you look at caterpillars in particular, there's different figures on different plants being compared, but it's probably somewhere in the range of 20 to 35 times as much as many caterpillars produced on native plants as there is on non-natives. And I'll give you some examples of those in a little bit. And then the last item I have listed is often these non-native plants then outcompete our natives. And so they wipe out these big areas. Excuse me, I'm gonna redo my phone here just a second. Okay, uh, they really outcompete our native plants, and what is the reason for that? Well, the reason is that when we move a plant from China or Germany or somewhere else in the world over here, we leave behind all the diseases and the pests and all the insects that are gonna keep it in check. So we get it over here, 
and it often just takes off and becomes very aggressive. And it wouldn't be so bad if it stayed in our nurseries or in our, our, in our own properties, but that's not what's happened. There's somewhere probably around 5,000 non-native plants throughout the United States. And of course, I'm sure most of you are familiar with bush honeysuckle or Japanese vining honeysuckle or lesser celadine, as I have mentioned here. Lesser celadine at the Nature Center just covers acres and it virtually wipes out all of our ephemeral plants. And when I mentioned ephemeral, um, those are the plants that come up very early before the canopy or the leaf canopy comes out to get the sunshine early in the spring or late winter even. And uh, one way I remember the ephemeral plants is it means fleeting. They're only here for a short time. It's kind of like some of my thoughts. Some days, you know, the thought is here one moment and gone the next. So again, a big issue with the non-natives out competing our native plants. And of course, when you think about it, that's why the ornamental horticulture industry loved to bring all these plants over and still does. They bring them over here from other countries because there's no insects that are going to eat them, or there's minimal number of insects that are going to eat them. So they love them from that standpoint. Unfortunately, not good for the ecology of our lands and properties. And again, natives are much more resilient than non-natives. And here's an easy comparison, looking at the root mass of some of the native plants, and then comparing it especially to fescue or the turf grasses, very shallow, and of course, that's why I had to water my lawn during the summertime when it was dry. I think the recommendation I always went by was about an inch of water every week on turf grass. Well, you don't have to do that with natives. After you get them established, two to three years down the line, they can get through droughts. And of course, you think about all the prairie plants that have been through months long droughts and still survive. So very resilient. And then I wanna move on to a more specific group of plants and talk about a butterfly garden. Usually I'm talking about a poll pollinator garden in general, but a butterfly garden is kind of a subset of a pollinator garden because there's two groups of plants that you need to have a butterfly garden. The first group is nectar plants, and don't worry about writing any of this uh, plant information down except for a couple of slides, which I'm gonna highlight in a moment because we've got lots of information that covers these sources. So the first group of plants that are necessary for the butterflies are nectar plants, but generally uh, the butterflies are generalists when it comes to nectar because nectar is very similar whether it's produced by a non-native plant or produced by a native plant. So that's not the issue. Here's the issue for butterfly gardens and that is host plants. And we recommend if you actually want to specifically grow a butterfly garden, try to have at least 70% host plants because that's the plant that mom butterfly looks for to lay her egg on. And it's the one that when that egg hatches, the caterpillar has to be on the proper plant because it's the one that it eats. And caterpillars are very, very tiny in their first stage, so they can't travel anywhere. If mom doesn't get them on the right plant, then they're doomed. So again, going back to the monarch, and this of course is the monarch Caterpillar, probably a pretty good, probably fifth stage, ready to pupate. And here's a common milkweed, a beautiful common milkweed flowering. And that's the other thing when you think about host plants, you can almost have all host plants in your butterfly garden because a lot of host plants are also great nectar plants. Now that's not always the case, so you may wanna add some nectar plants as well. But again, this is common milkweed with the monarch larva or caterpillar. And for instance, if I compared this to say pawpaw, which is the host plant for our beautiful, um, ooh, um, man, um, zebra swallowtail. <laughs> I'm out of butterfly mode here. Um, our beautiful zebra swallowtail. That swallowtail only uses pawpaw as its host plant. So if we lose pawpaws, like we've lost milkweed, we're gonna have a dramatic drop or we could completely lose our zebra swallowtails. So not all the host plants are that specific or the butterflies are that specific with their host plants. Some do use groups or genuses of plants like the pearl um, crescent, which is a nice a small gold and black butterfly. And it's very, you see it a lot. They use the aster family. So they have a lot more species to go after. 
Now, let me show you some things that we also want to be sure when we plant our pollinator garden or our butterfly garden, and that is that we want to have blooms throughout the three seasons, spring, summer, and fall. Spring is not too difficult, although, you know, you have to think about your ephemerals when we look at that, or violets, or the willows. Pussy willow is a great one. It's one of my favorites early, blooms very early, and mine is just covered with uh, bees and flies and wasps, even in sometimes in late February, early March, when the pussy willow is blooming. Then you've got lots of options for summertime. And then in the fall, we typically are looking at the goldenrods and the asters, uh, generally speaking, some other species as well. But if you need to fill in and you don't have the perennials to do that, you can then fill in with annuals. So things like verbena or lantana, you know, then there's a number of annuals that you can fill in with as well as this. And when I mention this, so far I've been talking mainly about perennials. Keep in mind that the trees and the shrubs are very, very important. And I'm going to show you why in just a moment. But a lot of the trees are early bloomers, and so are some of the shrubs. Like one of my favorite shrubs is the spice bush. It's actually, we call it our native forsythia. It's not the European forsythia with the big yellow bloom, but it's a smaller yellow bloom. It's still very pretty, comes out very early, and is a great nectar source um, as an early bloomer. So again, keeping in mind those trees and shrubs, very important. And here's why. Here are the best plant genera for butterflies and moths in Hamilton County, Ohio. And I was going to change this to include Franklin County, since I'm sure all of you are in that area or nearby. Uh, but actually, when I looked at the statistics, it is virtually identical to what I'm showing you here. So I didn't change it from that standpoint. And when we say best plant genera, Palmy and a lot of his students have worked to put in tremendous hours to look into this information. And they found that throughout the United States, there are certain genera, and they call it their keystone genera, of native plants that are extremely important. And matter of fact, I was really startled to see the statistic that he published in his last book um, about the fact that 5% of our native plants support about 70 to 75 percent of our lepidopter species. So if you're going to plant any plants and you're wondering which ones, these are the ones to pick right off the bat. For instance, when the saw is outside and you can get in the yard, if you put an oak in there, may not grow real fast, but oaks are tremendously important. When we're talking about how many species of Lepidopter, are they supporting? The oaks support in the neighborhood of 500 to 550 plus versus, say, the milkweed that I mentioned that supports the monarch. It does support 10 or 11 other species, insect species, and it does have a lot of insects that live on it. Or, sorry, Lepidopter, 10 or 11 other Lepidoptera. But compare that to an oak tree, 550 to 10 or 11. And many of our perennials are great to have because they're flowers and they're beautiful. So we want to have them. But I'm really going to emphasize use of these first three, oaks, cherries, and willows. And then on the herbaceous side, the goldenrods, the asters, and the sunflowers. So those are the ones you want to focus on to do the most, get the most bang for your buck. And then the next slide I'm going to show you quickly is our keystone plant genera for our specialist native bees. And when you look at this, you'll see that a lot of them are the ones we just saw. Here are the asters again, the sunflowers, the willows, and the goldenrods. So going back, if you hit those three or four or five here, you're also covering the specialist native bees. And why did Talmy list specialist native bees? Well, about 25% of our bee species are specialists, meaning they again, they work with only a few species to gain pollen. They're not looking particularly for the nectar. They're going after the pollen. And if you cover the specialist native bees, you're also going to support the generalists. So in essence, by including this, whoa, I don't know what happened there. By including all six of these, if you can do it, in your garden, in your native habitat, in your 
homegrown national park, then you're really going to be benefiting just about all the bees. So tremendous influence by really directing your efforts toward these particular species. Now, when you're going out and buy those plants, and let me just get a drink here for a moment. When you're going out and buy those plants, what do you want to look for? Well, we would prefer that you look for straight species, what we call straight, that's those plants that we know have been here. They're natives to this region for millennia. We know how good they are for the native wildlife. And when you get into cultivars, there can be some real questions about unnatural colors and shapes. And unfortunately, some of the cultivars are virtually useless to our native wildlife, to our pollinators. And here's a good example. Here's a cone flower that's been cultivated so large that it's not even available. Here's our beautiful purple cone flower. But matter of fact, it looks like a bumblebee and a skipper on it here. And then if you jump over here, everybody's familiar with roses, but what do you think about when you think of a rose? This one. Hardly anybody knows what a native rose looks like. It only has basically five petals, but it's very open and very available with nectar. So it's a terrific source, a terrific native rose versus our cultivated one. Now, people love roses. So of course, have some roses on your property. You know, we try to get people to move towards 70 to 75% native plants. That's what we'd like to see you try to do versus 25 or 30% non-native. You're always going to have some non-natives on there. If you love roses, hey, go for them. Just try to branch out into some of the non-natives as well. And if you can, try to stay away from the cultivars unless you get evidence, unless you get an article or someone is documenting that this particular cultivar is very good. As a matter of fact, here in Cincinnati, the Cincinnati Zoo does grow their own plants and they grow a lot of cultivars, but they do a lot of research into having those be very, very beneficial. So those are excellent cultivars to use and often a number of our nurseries have them. Excuse me. And they can also be beneficial because they've been cultivated to be shorter or to uh, bloom longer or maybe to be more hardy in our area, something like that. So in some cases, if you can document that the cultivar is beneficial, then go for it. And then another thing I'm going to look at here is a couple big cultural or personal differences that people have to go through when they migrate from non-native plants to native plants. And the first one is, here is Dr. Talmy's book. This is his first book that he listed, The Bringing Nature Home, and I highly recommend it to anyone who wants to delve into this subject. It's a, a great one. It's really a great naturalist book. He's also got all kinds of great pictures in it, great illustrations, and he talks about all the, a lot of particulars of this subject that I'm covering today in about an hour or so. But what he states is that if a plant doesn't feed something else, it's not doing its job. What does he mean by that? Well, a plant's, of course, feeding itself, but it's there to also feed our wildlife. That's what's evolved. Again, thinking about that evolution that's taken place. And what does that look like? Well, it looks like this. You're going to have holes in your plants, okay? And that's a good thing, right? I call this holistic medicine, H-O-L-E, holistic medicine. And Dr. Talby actually has a, what he call a 10-step process. If you look at this plant and you go, oh my God, Martha, go get the raid. Something's eating our plant. Then just do the 10-step process. And that's back up one, two, three, 10 steps and bingo, your problem disappears because you won't even see those holes in the plant. And when you think about it, when you go out in nature in a park and the nature preserve, um, Cincinnati Nature Center, et cetera, what do you do? You're there to take in the whole ambiance, you know, the smells, the sounds, the sights of the wildlife and the plants. You're not going up to the trees and shrubs and looking at every particular leaf and seeing if it's eaten. Because if you did, you'd find that a lot of them have, have, have been eaten by insects mainly. And thus, that's a very good thing. If you're a native plant person like myself, you go, hallelujah. This plant is feeding some wildlife. It's just not sitting there looking pretty. 
And unfortunately, that's what we've really focused our attention on for what, 100, 125 years is the beauty instead of the ecological benefit. So try to accept this as you move into the native plants and this way you're benefiting the native wildlife as well. And then the next big thing, and this was a tough one for me, you could see my manicured, manicured yard when I started out. Well, now I have the other yard and you need to allow your yard to be a little messy. Okay, you don't have to go extreme. For instance, this may be a little extreme. There's not too many people that probably want a brush, brush pile on their property. Not too many people with a field like this with a brush pile in it. But if you can do that on your property, if you're cutting down that bush honeysuckle or the multiflora rose or some of those other invasive plants or you've got ash trees dying, don't pull that wood off or the shrubbery off. Use it in the brush pile. And if you don't like the looks of it or you're concerned about your neighbor looking at it, hey, put some native plants around it like switchgrass, that's one of my favorite. It's a big bunch grass and it stands up virtually the whole year, even in this snow and weather we're having now. It's leaning a little bit now, but it'll pop back up. And if you put it around the brush pile, it'll protect the brush pile so people won't see it. And it's a great interaction between the grass and the brush pile. Why do I mention that? Because tons and tons of animals can use a brush pile. Okay, a myriad of animals can live in that. And so, it can be very beneficial. And if you aren't capable or don't have the means to have a brush pile on your property, then the, the most important thing to consider is having your leaves left on your property, okay? Most of us have leaves. Please don't send them off to the landfill. There are tremendous benefit to the property because they're free mulch. And this is the leaf litter, and I hate to use that term litter because it has a negative connotation. So I really say leaves or leaf mulch. It's a great mulch. It helps control our water, helps conserve water. It's also free fertilizer. So you've got the mulch, the leaves breaking down and in essence decomposing like in a compost pile, but yet even more benefit if you put it into your bed or if you don't have a lot of beds to use the leaves, just leave them underneath your trees. Often you have trouble with grass growing under your trees. So if you leave the leaves there, they can build up and they can enrich the soil over time. And then you can put some other plants in there, some shade tolerant plants. And that's an excellent way to do because one of the other things that Talmy mentioned in his uh, last book was the fact that a lot of these caterpillars that are in our trees are going to pupate into the soil under the trees. And if you have the hard rock kind of concrete grass underneath there, it really doesn't benefit the caterpillars that are trying to pupate. They can't get through that hard soil. So if you have a much more accepting soil where you're growing something or you have the leaf beds there, then that's much more, that's much more beneficial for the butterflies or any of the lepidoptera that are pupating into the soil. So again, leaf mulch, very, very important. And again, thinking about the number of animals that use a leaf mulch, anything from our bacteria up to our microinvertebrates to our macroinvertebrates, the centipedes, the millipedes, the springtails, you name it, on and on and on. And then even up to say some of them maybe our amphibians, our salamanders, our toads, et cetera. So it can be a terrific home for a myriad of wildlife uh, and during the winter, a very important blanket during this time of the year. The other thing to consider if you do have trees that you're bringing down or you're trimming trees, leave those dead limbs on your property. Again, if you don't like where they, how they look, put plants around them because they are a great home for all kinds of insects. And if you're able to leave even a dead tree standing, which we call a snag, if you're able to do that and not be a damage to the house or to you know somebody walking by or anything like that, that's a great thing to do as well. Or in my case, on my property, I'm fortunate to have five acres and I have uh, about 80, 85 ice trees die. So I've had a lot of them die. So instead of cutting them all the way down, the ones near the house or near a trail, I have my tree man cut them say at 20 feet and leave them standing at that base. And it's just a myriad of insects that use that and that course then moves on up the food chain when you end up with woodpeckers using it, um, possibly even getting a raccoon in there someday and that type of thing. So tremendous support with dead limbs or dead uh, trees, the leaf mulch and the brush piles. 
So again, that's a big cultural change though for us. Here's just some of the things you can look forward to. I have about 31 species of butterflies that I've noted that I've ID'd on my property. This is a silvery checker spot on a, on a purple cone flower. And then this particular slide may be almost as important as those keystone genera that I mentioned earlier, because this slide is about you, okay? If you don't feel comfortable, if you're not, don't take pride in your habitat, in your national homegrown national park, or in enjoying it, you're probably not going to continue to do it. And you're certainly probably not going to pass it along to other people and spread the word. So we want you to enjoy what you're doing. Make it homey. Turn it into your own property by adding you know, pots and putting uh, annuals in those or bird houses, bird feeders, any other type of wildlife uh, enhancements. Cut the trails, cut your paths. And if you want to make it more formal, like I showed with the front of my house, cut out your, your beds. Edge your beds closely if you want a more formal approach. Matter of fact, Talmy mentions that the formality in a garden is really based on the design, not on the plants you're using. So just because you're using native plants, you don't have to have a messy or just a wild looking area. You can certainly have a more formal area by edging or as I say, mowing, etc. And you want to certainly get a chair or a bench in this so you can go out and listen to your, your uh, beautiful native species. I go out and every summer, I look forward to all the bees and wasps and flies humming around my bee bomb. I can stand there for five or 10 minutes sometimes just listening and watching them. Does anyone do that with lawn? Nope, right? Nothing much to listen to when you're sitting in the lawn. So again, really emphasize making this your own property, your own preserve, your own homegrown national park. Whoops, I'm sorry. One thing I didn't mention here right in the middle of this picture, of course, is the genus and species of this particular animal is Felinus cementi. Okay, this is the best outdoor cat to have. You don't have to feed it, you don't have to clean up after it, and it doesn't do any wiping out of any species outdoors. So again, if you have a cat, it's really best to keep it in, or I know people now have even gone to catios, what they call catios, it's a patio for a cat, or it's an attachment to a, your home, it allows the cat to kind of get outdoors, but still not be free roaming around. So again, keep that in mind because uh, cats can be an issue. And then, when we're talking about sustainability, one of the big things we would like you to consider is staying out of this aisle. I have this blurry picture because I want it to continue to look blurry, that you don't have focus on this. We want to allow the native habitat to develop a dynamic balance. And that's what, of course, is developed in our woods, in our forests, in our fields, in our prairies. That's how the fauna and flora live together in a dynamic balance, keeping one and another in check. And basically, in your property, on your property, within probably two or three years, we get enough native plants, you'll get this dynamic balance where the predator and prey will balance out. And often, even if you have aphids, you'll get ladybugs coming in, etc. So you won't need to use the pesticides. So we hope you'll stay away from that. Very important. And then just a couple other pictures here of my property. Here's the back of the property during the spring with some red bud and bloom, and this is service berry, a silver on a uh, silver bell. Uh, I do have a yucca there. My parents retired to Arizona, and that's my second state, so I do have a yucca kind of to uh, keep them in my memory. And then here's a fall picture. You can get a lot of fall color with natives just as well as you can with non-natives, certainly. And then we'll start to wrap up here, and I can't even see my timer, so I'm not sure how I'm doing time-wise here since I'm using the cell phone. Um, we'd like you to consider certifying your yard and please consider doing it through the National Wildlife Federation. I'm a volunteer for them as well. And you do that by supplying food, water, cover, and places to raise young. And you can do that sustainably. And this is all on the honor society, honor society, all on the honor system. You basically are just really, when you fill out the application electronically on the NWF website, 
you just check off. Yes, you have food available, you have water, and that's probably the one that can be a little tricky. You may have to have a, you know, a bird bath or a puddling area for butterflies, or maybe a bubbler is great, something like that. And actually, when you think about it, if you have an oak tree, or going back to those trees again, you think about an oak tree, I would argue that it actually supplies all four of these in one. It certainly has food, right? The acorns, the leaves are eaten. Secondly, how about water? Where do the caterpillars get their water? Do they come down the tree once a week and go to a creek or a pond? Nope. They're getting their water from the leaves, either eating the leaves or the moisture on the leaves. And of course, it, it's cover for all kinds of animals, squirrels, birds, you name it. And then that's a place to raise their young. Squirrels have their drays or the nests there. Birds, of course, have their nests. And actually, you could even look at the caterpillars that are being raised on that oak tree. So again, one oak tree, meet all four of these. And then if you do it in a sustainable manner, you meet all the criteria. Uh, it's $20 to become certified. You get a nice certificate. You get, become a member for a year, get a, the uh, National Wildlife Magazine, get discounts, et cetera. So keep that in mind if you would, please. And then just show you a couple quick other pictures here of a beautiful, there's a swamp milkweed with an Eastern tiger swallowtail and an American, um, oh um, boy, like I said, my butterflies are kind of rusty on those today. Um, painted lady, excuse me, this is American lady on Pearly Everlasting. And then I'll leave with the last comment here is a pollinator garden, or we could sub in here, the homegrown national park may not change the world. What it may change is how you look at the world. Okay, let me then kind of wrap this up and let me also mention just a couple other things before I move on to questions and wrap up. And that is when you think about doing this, it doesn't have to be very involved, okay? You can do, make this transition into native plants very easily by just kind of filling in some of your holes in your landscape with a few native plants, starting out slow, and then developing from that standpoint, or maybe just taking out a little part of your yard. And even you can go an even easier way, and that is if you're treating your yard, either by a lawn service or yourself, stop treating either all or part of it and let it go natural. And within, oh, probably six months, year, you're gonna have clover come in, which actually white clover is a non-native, but it's an excellent source uh, as far as uh, supporting Lepidoptera and a great nectar source for a lot of animals as well, bees especially, of course. And so you're gonna get dandelions, you'll get plantain, all really good species to support a lot of wildlife. So you don't have to spend any money. Matter of fact, you can save money by doing that and allowing your yard to go natural. And if you wanna go one step further, allow that natural yard to grow during the summer, up and don't mow it, but maybe every two weeks or even every three weeks, if you can let it go that long. You may not do, do that during the really high growing season, you know, spring, late spring and early summer. But if you do, you get, you really be benefiting the pollinators. Uh, there was a study done by the U.S. Forest Service in Massachusetts. They looked at 16 lawns, and at three weeks, people that mowed at three weeks, they went back and sampled all these yards. They found out that there was about over 100 species of native bees from the Massachusetts area that were using that native lawn. That was about 25% of the bee species in the state. So just by allowing your lawn to get higher to grow and allow those plants to develop their flowers, then it's really very beneficial. Another thing you can do is just take a part of your lawn or a section of your um, landscaping and let it go totally natural. Don't even mow it. And within two or three years, you're going to have, I'll guarantee it, you'll have asters come in there, you'll have goldenrod, you'll have wingstem, you'll have violets, you'll have plantain, you'll have a lot of native plants, it doesn't cost you a cent and takes really very little work. All you have to do is pull out the non-native stuff that starts to encroach in that area and just keep the natives growing. So those are just a few things to keep in mind. And please remember, if you do start to plant, always a good idea when you're planting those non-native plants to put wire around them, okay? <laughs> we always have our deer problem or our raccoon problem or our chipmunk problem, rabbits, you name it. I, matter of fact, I use two layers of wire around my new plants 
and I'll use it for maybe sometimes a year or two, depending on how long it takes for that plant to get established. I put chicken wire along the base, around the bottom, and then have, say, 48-inch high wire. And if you go out and buy three or four or, say, two or three 50-foot rolls, you can use that wire for years and years. I've got some that goes back 15, 20 years. Steve, thank you very much. The great pictures and wonderful information. And it's lovely to look yeah. at flowers and such in the middle of an ice storm. So thank you for that. <laughs> okay, yeah. And uh, good luck to everyone.